If I had the ability to listen in and hear your prayers, what would I hear on your most desperate day? Not just a bad day, not just when things aren't quite going how you wish, but when you are really at the end of your rope, on your most desperate, your, your lowest point, if I could hear you praying then, what would I hear? Some of you wouldn't want me to hear that. You wouldn't want anyone to hear that. If you, some of you wouldn't even have the strength to pray or have any words that could come out of your mouth. But when we are desperate... But when we come to that place, what should our prayers be? What should we pray? How can we pray at that moment? That's what we're going to talk about this morning. How can we pray when we are desperate, when we are at the end of our rope, when it seems like all hope is gone, when we just can't even cognitively function? How can we pray when we're desperate? But we're going to continue our series looking at Psalms 22. And this series, we're spending it talking about how can we pray the Psalms. And looking at the Psalms and seeing how they are prayers. This morning we'll get to hear the recorded prayer of David at a time when he was desperate. And by looking at these and reading them and hearing them, these Psalms will teach us how we too are supposed to pray and how we can pray when we're desperate. And so this morning, I'm just, we're going to look at three, three things. It's really an order to our prayers. It's a way to think about how we should pray when we're desperate. So if you would, turn with me um, in your Bibles to Psalm 22. And if you're able, go ahead and stand as I read God's Word. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, and you they trusted and were not put to shame, but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb, who made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you I was cast from birth. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening, roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax that is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh God, be not far from me. O oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall bow before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow down all who go down to dust. Even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him and it shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. And they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. That he has done it. The grass withers, 
and the flower fades, but God's word stands forever. Let's pray, Lord, I ask that you would come here this morning. Lord, would your spirit fall in this place? Would you fill me with boldness to preach your word? Would you fill us with ears to hear and receive the words from your mouth? We pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen. You can be seated. So as we were to look here and see kind of, a, I'm going to try and give you an order to our prayer. So when we're desperate, how should we pray? What should we pray? Well, number one, or your first point here on how the, where we start is weep. So we start by weeping. Just kept it very simple with, with one words, but there, there is moments in life when all that you can do is weep. There are times that things come and the only thing you can do is cry. There is suffering that is so great that that's all we can do. And I'm not talking about just a single tear falling down your face as you put on a brave face and dig down deep and take a deep breath and are really strong. I'm talking about the times that all you do is fall in a puddle on the ground and cry. The times when it feels like you are just dry heaving and there's no sound that can come out because all you're doing is weeping. When you're so overcome with suffering that your mind is like a cloud and a fog and you almost feel drunk or like you can't stand. That's the kind of weeping and the desperation, I mean. The desperation that comes when you've lost a child or a loved one, or a spouse. The desperation that comes when the diagnosis comes in and it was exactly what you were afraid that it would be. The desperation that comes when there's that bill and you don't know how you're going to pay it because all of, you've got no money left and you've gone and begged everywhere that you could. When all we can do is weep. These are moments that that's the only thing we can do. And this is where the psalmist, this is where David finds himself in the beginning. All he can do is cry. And he begins by acknowledging that this prayer is coming through his own tears. Right away in verse 2, Oh my God, I cry by day and you don't answer me. And by night, but I find no rest. He's describing a day and a night just spent doing nothing but crying. I'm sure all of us in this room have had days like that. When all we do is cry. All he is doing is so desperate. Is every moment that he is awake, that he is cognizant, he is crying. He can't even fall asleep because he's in so much pain and suffering. And you look at, at verse 1 where he says, you know, why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? I want to focus on that word groaning there. It's not just like a quiet groan of pain or discomfort. That, that word is, is used to describe the roaring of lions, mostly. It's not a small groan. It is a loud, primal just yell. Kind of sound you make when you don't have words, but you just got to get something out, and that's all that can come is a groan or a roar. I think part of what this psalm is telling us is that it's a reminder that it's okay to cry. None of us really like to cry. Some of you may, but most of us do not. Especially the men in this room, I would be surprised if you like to cry. Because our culture, our generation, it tells us, especially men, no, 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 we do not cry. Tears make us uncomfortable. If I started crying and weeping now, it would make this room a little uncomfortable too to listen. Even when, this is why when children cry, so what do we want? just stop, please. This is not worth crying. We want to end it. We want to end the tears as quick as we can and get to something more productive or something else. The psalm is telling us in the beginning, or what I'm saying too, is it is okay to weep. That there are times in our lives where all you can do is weep. And that is okay, especially if our tears and our crying is directed towards God. Oftentimes we cry not just because we're in pain, but we just don't understand what's happening. And we cannot comprehend the situation we are facing or the news that we have received. This is why grief, right, the first stage is denial. It's a refusal to accept reality. Because that is all of our first reaction when we hear something that we don't like. Is no, 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 this can't be. And if we ever do any out of that or even there, so why? 
Why? And this is where the psalm starts. Anyway, it's verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far? Why, God? His tears in this whole song is threaded through it is just with that question of why? Why are you allowing this to happen? Most of our psalm and most of our prayers often are that too, aren't they? Just why God? Why them? Why this? Why would you allow this? How could you do this? Why? The psalm gives us permission to ask God that question. That question that comes to us in our grief and our desperation of why God would you do this. This psalm tells us it's okay to pray that. It's okay to ask God that. And this is King David, the greatest man in Israel's history. Their favorite king, the one they were most proud of, the one that they looked forward to Jesus thinking he'll be just like David, but maybe even better, we can barely comprehend that. A man who is called after God's own heart, he feels comfortable asking God why. Why have you abandoned me? Verses 4 and 5. And you, our fathers, trusted. They trusted you and you delivered them. To the, you they cried and were rescued. And in you they trusted and they were put to shame. But I'm just a worm. Why, God? Why aren't you doing for me what I've seen you do for others? How come you've rescued them? You answered their prayer when they cried. And I'm praying now and my prayers are not being heard. All my life I've heard, God, your promises of I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, I'll always be with you, and yet here I am, God, and you've forsaken me. Where are you? Why? We also know much of this psalm probably sounds familiar, especially this first verse. It is the words in a psalm that Jesus prayed while hanging on the cross. These words of, of why, God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They came out of the mouth of our Savior. Out of the mouth of God incarnate. If Jesus can pray that, if David can pray that, I think we can too. I want to put on you know, a teacher hat for, for just a minute and talk some theology. It'll, just, it'll be brief, but stay with me. Okay, you can handle this. It's not too terribly difficult, but it's significant. And I want to show you why this matters. It's important to note when Jesus prayed that on the cross, that didn't mean that God had actually abandoned him. Some go out of whack and will say, well, see, at the cross, the Trinity was broken momentarily and God turned his back on him and Jesus was completely abandoned and left alone. And that, you know, at the cross, then God no longer really exists. In Trinity, as one essence or one substance in three persons. Now, for a few moments, we have two gods because God forsook him. Okay, you can see or think, well, if we have two gods for momentarily, wait, that seems, that, that's not right. That's a problem. The Trinity is difficult. The Trinity is hard to understand. Most of us prefer to ignore it. But at its essence and its core is we worship one God. We don't worship two gods. We don't worship three gods. We worship one God who is greater and harder than our minds could ever comprehend. So even Jesus said this, but it didn't mean that the Trinity was broken. Okay, why, why does that matter? Well, here's why it matters. If Jesus can pray that, when he knows more than any of us could ever know that he is still a part of the Godhead and that God has not actually forsaken him and God is still right there with him, if Jesus can then pray that in that moment, that also means we can pray it too. Means even Jesus in his humanity felt as if that was true, even though he knew deep down that it wasn't. That's why I think Jesus prayed that. And in the midst of our pain and our suffering, there are times that it, that is all we can pray and all we can cry. And it was Jesus didn't pray the rest of the psalm. That was all he got out that we have recorded. There are times... That the only way we can pray, or at the very least, the only way we can begin is just with weeping and with tears. There'll be moments when you do not have the strength to pray. When you don't have the strength to even use words. Look at verses 14 and 15. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted. My strength is dried up and my tongue sticks to my jaws. I'm so much pain, I can't even move my mouth to make words come out. That, that feels like what's going on inside is that everything is melting within me. 
Some of you have maybe felt pain like that recently. Maybe you've even felt physical pain that has felt like that. It's okay to weep. There are our tears in weeping, it shouldn't be the only prayers that we pray. But there are some times that it is the only prayers that we can. Now, we don't want to stay here our whole lives, obviously. But there will be moments like this. And what I want you to know is when you are in that moment and you are desperate, and that is all that you can do, do not beat yourself up and feel like if you were way more spiritual, you wouldn't be crying right now. You would have some beautiful prayer prepared. It's okay. Sometimes all you can do is weep and ask God why. Don't feel like you're less spiritual because you don't have a great prayer ready in the midst of grief. Let those tears begin your prayer. So that's the beginning, but we don't want to end there. So what's, what's next? How do we move out of that? Well, the next, the next way we move is we move to begging. So first we weep, and second, as you take notes, is we need to beg that we just beg God. No longer do we just cry wordlessly and with our tears, but now we move to words. And before we move to thanking God, or before we move to the exciting praising, we, we gotta, there's got to be a step in between. And that step is begging. So he, and the psalmist has no problem doing this. Verse 11, be not far from me. God, please come close. Trouble is near and there is none to help. No one can help me. The psalmist admits, I've got nowhere else to go, God. I've tried. I've called up all my friends. I've gone through my Rolodex, my phone book, done everything that I know how to do, and no one can help me. I'm coming to you. If you don't help, I'm sunk. I'm in trouble, God. Please, don't be far. There's no one here to help me. Generally speaking, none of us really like to ask for help, right? We like to be independent. That's kind of our American ethos. If we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and here we, we work hard and we do things ourselves, we don't need the government, we don't need, I don't need anybody, I don't need anyone to help me. I can do it through hard work and, and grit. I can get this done. And so that's why often we don't, right? And that's why we don't want to ask somebody for directions, even though I have no idea where I'm going, and I don't think I'm going to figure it out. But, you know, I'll be darned if I'm going to ask anybody for help, because I'm going to do this. If I ask for help, it's admitting weakness. I don't want to share that prayer request. I don't want that to go on the email. Then everyone's going to know i got problems. Everyone's going to know I can't pay that bill, or I've got this, and it really stinks, and I don't know how to handle that. All right, we, don't, we don't like to beg. All of us wish, or I think if we're honest, we all imagine and would long to be able to just do everything that we ever needed to do without asking anybody for help. That would be the dream. That would feel like a good day. We try to solve our own problems, and often the only time we run to prayer is when we've realized we can't do it anymore. This is where David's at. Well, God, there's no one else to help. I've tried, I've done all the things I know how to do, and now there, there's nothing else. No one can help me anymore. David's not too proud to beg. And he also begs because he knows there's no way he can make God do anything either. Okay, God is God and we are not. We're just men and women. And now God loves us and cares for us. And that's incredible. But at the end of the day, we, we can't control him. We can't manipulate him. We can't say our prayers the right way and suddenly he does what we want. So there are times we just have to beg and beg that the God of the universe would show up and would help us. And he, David knows he's got to pray and he's got to beg this. And we don't know exactly when David is praying this in his life. There's any number of times that this could have been. David found himself desperate in many different moments. It could have been when he was trapped in the mountains and an outlaw as King Saul is trying to kill him and he's on the run, hiding in caves, having to flee his homeland. It could have been then. Because in verse 12, it talks about many bulls are encompassing me. The strong bulls of Bashan surround me and they're opening wide their mouths. They're trying to get me. 
and verse 16, where he says, dogs are accompanying me, a company of evildoers encircling me. So uh, I'm surrounded by enemies on every side, God. It could have been then. Could have also been when his son started a coup and overthrew his government and took the city and took the kingdom and it seemed like everything that he'd had had slipped out of his hands. And then once again, he was on the run. It could have been then. There were many moments he had nowhere else to turn to but to God, where he was surrounded by enemies and could not see a way out. We should beg God too because there are many things in life and there are many things that will come or have come where there's nowhere else you can go for help. There's nowhere else you can go. No matter what your life has been or your circumstances are now, if this hasn't been you before, you will one day find yourself in a place where no one else can help you except for God. You will find yourself in a place where there is no police or government or justice system that could possibly bring justice to make something right. You will find yourself at a place where there is no doctor or surgeon or specialist who can even figure out what is wrong with you, and even if they could, could fix it. You will find yourself at a place where you can't possibly pay the bills and you've gone every place you can and you can't find another dollar. All of us will come to places where we are completely helpless. And the only thing we can do is just beg God to help. Look at how David begs in 19 through 21. He, he begs even more, but you, O Lord, be not far off. Uh, you're my help. Come quick, please. There's exclamation points here. You can hear the desperation coming through. Deliver my soul. Save me. 21. He's just begging God. Please. If you don't save me, God, there's no one else to help. I, I'm dead. I will die. They will find me. I'm not good enough at this hiding thing. I don't see a way out. But there are reasons as well that we, not just that we should beg, but there's reasons that we can beg God. One of the reasons we can beg God is we can beg God because of God's past faithfulness. We don't have to beg God just because He's the only one who can help, but we beg Him because He's one who has helped others before. But He's a God who has been faithful to those who have begged. Again, uh, verse 4, And you, our fathers, trusted. They trusted you and you delivered them. They cried, they begged, and you rescued them. And you they trusted and they weren't put to shame. They weren't embarrassed after having asked you for help because you brought it. God has a track record of answering the prayers of beggars. God answered the begging prayer of Hagar. When she was kicked out and cast aside with her son by Abraham and Sarah and thought that she was going to die and saw no way out and no help. And then God answered and saved her. And she responded by naming and saying, this is the God who sees because he heard my begging cry and moved. This is the, the God who answered the prayer of the slaves in Egypt as they were generations born and died under the Egyptian whip in bondage and in chains, in great suffering and their tears and their crying out, God came to Moses and said, I have heard the tears of my people and I am here to answer. God heard the begging prayer of Jonah. We read part of this morning that from the middle of a whale's belly for three days, finally begged out of desperation. You can't get much further than needing help than that. And God heard and delivered him and coughed him up on dry land. We can pray and we can beg because God has a track record of being faithful, of answering the prayers of beggars. We can also pray because he's worthy of our trust. He's trustworthy. At the end of our lives, when we finally see him face to face, whether he returns in two moments or whether that... What comes when we die, we will not be put to shame. Verse 6, but I am a worm, 
Uh, David acknowledges, look, you were faithful to them, but God, I'm begging you because I realize that I am as about as desperate as you can get. Please, I know you've been faithful to others. Would you, could you be faithful to a lowly worm like me? That's a begging prayer. Could I just please have some, God, just a little bit of your faithfulness? We can also pray, or we can beg based on God's character. Verse 3, Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. That's the God we pray to, is the holy God. Another way of describing holiness, I uh, heard, is weightiness. If you're in the room and God's holiness is there, that there's almost a weight on the air that just pushes against you and encompasses you. You can feel it. You know that He's there. Scripture often tells us that because God is so holy, if we saw Him, we would fall dead immediately. Because His holiness is incomprehensible and we are way far from holiness. We're worms in His presence. His holiness is close to unfathomable and indescribable. You could spend a thousand years meditating, studying, reading, thinking about just that phrase, you are holy, and you still would not come close to getting it. You could fill and you could read all of the books on all of the shelves, in all of the libraries, in all of the homes, in all of the world throughout all of time. If all of those were filled just talking about God's holiness, they wouldn't even be more than a drop in the ocean of how great His holiness is. And because He is so holy, that's why we have to beg. If He's that holy and we are just worms and man, man, God, what is man that you are mindful of Him? That's why we beg. But we also beg and we pray, we ask, because He is holy, yes, but He is also good. He is a good God. He might be unfathomable. He might be hard to understand. We may never understand why he says yes to some things and he says no to others. But what we do know is he doesn't do it because he's cruel. He doesn't do it because he's unkind. He doesn't do it just because he's a jerk and he sits up on his holy mountain and he laughs at the worms like us. No, he has compassion for us and he loves us and he's good and he cares. If we ask him for something, he denies us. It's not because he hates us. It's not because he wants us to suffer, because he just enjoys it and thinks it's fun. Like a kid burning ants with a magnifying glass. That's not what God does. He's good. Matthew 7 reminds us that our God is a good father. And because, what father, if we beg and we ask him for bread, would give us snakes? It may feel like maybe sometimes that's what God has done to you, but he is not. He is good. A good way to formulate our prayers often when we beg is to be acknowledge that your God, the God you're asking is good and He loves you. You can also ask based on His holiness and His character, right? If you're asking for things, there are some things that we beg and we ask God for. And I could tell you just by asking me that no, He will never answer that prayer. Because you're asking for something that is, that's outside of the bounds of what He would do. Or you're also asking for something that's really not good for you at all. If God gave you that, that would just lead you further into sin. Why would God answer that? And there's a reason God never answered any of my childhood prayers for millions of dollars. Okay, I prayed that one a lot. Every now and then I still pray it. I'm, I'm waiting for God to answer that. I definitely have to beg because that's the only way I think I'm going to get it is if God just drops it down on me. Okay, there's a reason God hasn't answered that, as, even as I joke. Why? Because, well, that much money would lead me to some sin and some idolatry. And God knows that, and so He's keeping that from me. Why? Because He's good, not because He hates me, but because He loves me. One of my favorite songs that I think just really captures this idea of begging God, it's based on the prayer of a man, of a blind man who asked Jesus for healing. And I love this song, it just captures it. It kind of paints a picture of that moment. As Jesus is passing by and this blind man just yells out and asks, Son of David, have mercy on me. And people tell him, hey, shh, shh, stop, please, you're, you're annoying. Jesus doesn't want to hear that. 
It says he just yelled out louder and kept begging. And the song begins and just says, you know, come closer. Find me broken. Find me bleeding. Because I need more now than a fairy tale. A God who lives in a book doesn't mean anything to me. I need something more. Often I felt that. Man, man, God, if if you're just abstract ideas in a book, that's not going to help me today. I needed the real God to show up. God, come closer. Now, the song continues because I'm broken. I need something real. So would you come? If I begged you, God, would you come? Would you come closer? And it repeats, but the, the, the highlight of it, for, for me, it goes to the bridge. And it really stops being that musical and, and that beautiful. That's probably why it's not that popular of a song. Because the, the artist stops singing beautifully and really just starts yelling and crying desperately as that blind man did. And yells out, Son of David, don't pass me by. Because I'm naked, I'm poor, and I'm blind. Son of David, don't pass me by. Please have mercy. That's what the blind man did when he begged Jesus. Son of David, please have mercy. I beg you. But everyone's telling him, shut up, be quiet. You're annoying. Jesus doesn't want to hear that. And he yells even louder. But Jesus hears his begging. Jesus asks him, hey, what do you want? I want to be healed. Well, your faith has made you clean. Our, Our begging It's an expression of faith. When you beg, when you're desperate, you're acknowledging Jesus and God is the only way that you can get any kind of aid and any kind of help. I love that that song and that story. It embodies desperate prayer and a desperate asking of God for aid. When there's nowhere else we can go, I think that that's how we should beg Jesus. That's how we should pray. Number three, the, the third order to, to our prayers, or where we end our prayers, and then hopefully when we're desperate, is praise. As we end with praise. And the most significant reason, well, how can we praise even as the midst is we're desperate? Well, the reason that David can pray is found in verse 24. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. It's himself. He's not hidden his face, but he has heard when he cried to him. He has heard. He says, you've heard my prayer. My begging, my tears, all the things I've thrown at you, God, you've heard them. You've listened to this afflicted worm of a beggar begging you for help. And he, he moves from that tears and this begging to praise. And it, and it begins in verse 22. I'll begin, I'll tell your name to my brothers. I'm going to tell everyone in the midst of the congregation. I'm going to stand up during announcement time because I'm just too excited. And I've got to tell everyone and I have to praise you. Why? Because he's heard my prayers. The reason in general that we can just pray, period, is because God hears us. Our prayers do not just go out into the beyond and that's it. Our prayers are not just for ourselves so we gain something and become better people. Our prayers actually go and are heard by the God of the universe. He listens when we cry. And so generation to generation, that fact alone, verse 23, you who fear the Lord, praise Him. All you offspring of Jacob glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. That, that's us in this room as well. We are all the spiritual offspring of Israel. We worship and we pray to the, the same God that David prayed to. We pray to the same God that Abraham prayed to. We pray to the same God that Jacob and Isaac and Moses and all of the rest prayed to. And we should praise for that fact alone. Just the idea that God hears us when we pray. No, no, God may not give you what you want. He doesn't give me what I want much of the time. He doesn't doesn't even answer. This sermon isn't a cheat code to getting God to answer your prayers. I wish it was. I wish I had one. I'd have that million dollars. You know, I'd have stuff. I'd have more of my prayers answered. Just because you beg, just because you cry, does not mean that God will answer in the way that you want. 
There are prayers that I have prayed on my knees through sobs and God has still not answered what I wished. That person I love still died. The person whose salvation I begged for and still beg for still doesn't know Jesus, seems further than ever. That debt remains unpaid. There are things that God may not answer our prayers in the ways that we hoped. He does, and then when he does, maybe he doesn't do what we wish he would have done. But God is not worthy of praise because he does what I want. Or God is not worthy of praise because he is a genie who answers all of our wishes. Our God is worthy of praise simply because of who he is. Even if God never answered a single prayer of mine, though he has and he does and he will, even if he didn't, he still is holy and he still is God and he still is worthy of praise. So I can't promise you God will answer your prayers in the way that you wish, but what I can promise you is when you run to him with your tears and when you run to him desperately begging with nowhere else to go, he hears you. He hears your voice. He knows what you are asking about. He knows the situation more intimately than you ever could imagine. And he is listening like a good father who loves you. And we can also praise. Our, our tears and our begging can turn to praise because of Jesus. Because Jesus has felt our pain. Jesus has felt desperate suffering as well. We can be comforted and, and pray this prayer and praise God because as much as David felt these words when he wrote them, as much as he meant it and it was expressing his heart, as much as we, if we read this or we pray this in our own lives and we feel it and it feels true, Jesus actually lived out much of this psalm. There are things that David felt happened to him, but Jesus actually experienced on an even greater level. He cried out again, this first verse, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he was murdered and executed on a cross, dying slowly. And he was despised by all mankind or the people around him in verse 6. God came down to earth to save us and how did we respond? We killed him. So we didn't like it. He didn't do it the way that we wished he would have. That he was mocked. Everyone around him, verse 7, all who see me mock me. They make their mouths at me and they wag their heads and they laugh at him. That's why Jesus had that crown of thorns. As they pounded on his head, laughing at how funny it was at the irony. This guy thinks he's a king. Here's your crown, king. Here, let's put this robe on him as he carried his cross, barely able to stand, eventually had to have someone else help him because he couldn't. And they all called him, and they nailed that over the top of the cross. King of the Jews, here's your king. He died being mocked. Even as he hung on the cross for a while, those two men hanging next to him, also criminals, also being executed, joined in at the mockery, at the laughing. Everyone piled it on. Jesus' whole life was poured out like water in verse 14. In verse 16, they pierced his hands and his feet with massive nails as he hung there. And that was the only thing that held him in place. I imagine as he hung there in that, that that probably made his bones fall out of joint in verse 14. Can't imagine that his shoulders bore that well. I don't know how this wouldn't come out of socket or it wouldn't do all sorts of horrible things to your body. I'm sure that any human strength he had after hours and hours and hours of hanging there, after being whipped till his back was raw and unrecognizable, that his strength was not dried up. That his tongue didn't stick to the roof of his mouth. Which is why he begged for a drink of water and how did they respond? They gave him vinegar instead. Again, to mock his suffering. And they gloated over his death, 17. And as he lay there dying in 18, they divided his garments and they cast lots for his clothing. They rolled dice to see who got his stuff before he finished dying. Who gets the privilege of taking trophies off this person that used to be important? Is what they thought. 
We can praise because Jesus has felt our suffering too. Hebrews 4.14 reminds us that we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weakness. We don't worship a God who's unable to sympathize with our suffering and with our tears. We worship and we pray to a God who has also felt as desperate and as painful and as empty and as lacking of strength, humanly speaking, as you have. He knows. We can, Jesus himself prayed these desperate prayers. And we can also pray even through our tears because through the tears and the suffering of Jesus, all mankind has been redeemed. That on the cross, Jesus bore our sins. Now, on the cross, he paid the penalty for our death. The wages of sin is death. All of us deserve nothing more than death and hell right now. And yet... Jesus came and took that penalty Himself. He died our death in our place. He bore the punishment and suffering that we should have for us. So that all could come and experience salvation if you turn to Jesus, you repent of your sins, you call out and ask Him to be a Savior. Because of Jesus... In his wonderful salvation, verse 26 can be true. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forevermore. Because of Jesus, 27, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. Because of Jesus, at the end of time, every human being will bend their knee and acknowledge even if as much as they hated him and are still even refuse to follow him, that he is clearly God. Verse 28, for kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over nations. Because of Jesus, all the prosperous and 29 of the earth shall eat and worship and before him, everyone shall bow. Because of Jesus, 30, prosperity shall serve him, be told to the Lord, to the coming generation. And they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. That he has done it. A people yet unborn. That, that was all of us here in this room. Because of Jesus got to hear his victory proclaimed. He did it even before our parents were born. Before most of the people that we've heard of were created. Jesus is Lord, and Jesus is holy. And because of Jesus, all of our tears and all of our begging can turn into praise. And because of Jesus, our prayers are actually heard. Jesus stands as our intercessor. Jesus stands before the throne of God and prays on our behalf because of what Jesus did on the cross. Not just is salvation available to us, not just will we get to go to heaven one day, not just is there life after death, not just is there life right here and now, but also God will hear our prayers because of the blood of Jesus. That is why we pray in Jesus' name. It's not just a magic phrase we throw in at the end. It shouldn't either even just be a habit that comes out of our mouths and we don't even know or think of why do we do that. We pray in the name of Jesus because His name is the only reason and the only way that we can pray. Our tears and praise may not, or our tears and begging may not turn to praise yet. Some of you this morning, you may be stuck in the throes of, pray, of pain and maybe you, you feel like you can't praise Him yet. Or if you're, you're not there today, you know, one day you will be. Don't know when it will come, but I'm sure there will come a day where you feel like you can't praise Him. All you can do is weep. What I do want to remind you is that one day all of our tears will turn to praise. One day. It may not be tomorrow. It may not be today. It may not come until Revelation 21 when Jesus returns in glory and all tears are wiped away from our eyes. And then we can praise and cry and beg no more because the God who hears our prayers is right in front of us. So that's how we pray when we're desperate. I think it's a good order. We start with weeping. Because it's the only place we can start. 
Move to begging. Beg God not because he hears you, because he is the only place you can pray to, because he is good, he is holy. Beg based on his faithfulness because our God hears the prayers of beggars. And then praise. We can praise because Jesus hears us. We can praise because one day all of our tears will be gone. And we can praise and we can pray to the God who has suffered as we have and has suffered even more than we can imagine simply because he loves us and wants to offer us new life. That's how we pray even when we're desperate and we can't find the words. And close us in prayer and invite the, the worship team to come up and lead us to worship our suffering God. Lord, I, I praise you that you hear us. Lord, I am grateful that even the, the prayers of nobodies, the prayers of worms and of beggars like me who have nowhere else to go and no place to turn, God, that you hear our prayers. You hear our prayers even when they aren't worded well. You hear our prayers even when they're nothing but tears. You hear our prayers even when they're desperate, annoying begging. God, I thank you. I thank you for what your son did on the cross for us. I thank you that because of Jesus, salvation is available to any who would come. Lord, I ask that you would help us. Oh Lord, we don't even know how to pray often, but we especially don't know how to pray when we're at the end of our ropes. Lord, would you help us? Would you aid us? When that moment comes for us or for those who are in the midst of that moment now, would you come and give us the strength to pray? Would you teach us how to pray, how to beg? Would you teach us how to praise you? Because you are so worthy of every praise from every mouth that has ever lived or existed throughout all of time. We pray this in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. Would you stand as we continue to worship? Amen. Hear this benediction from the end of Ephesians. Peace be to the brothers and sisters in love with faith. From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love uncorruptible. Go in peace. You're dismissed.